Welcome, book lovers. Welcome back to our monthly book discussion. We have Phil Spitek and yep. myself, Marissa Serafini. We, this month, we are talking 100 Years of Solitude by Gabrielle Yemakis, first originally published in 1967 in Argentina, and then uh, re republished in English. Um, the English version 1970. So we're gonna get into it. There's a lot of spoilers. If you haven't read this book, I say pause, go read it, and then come back to us. So we're gonna get into it. Phil, quick thoughts. So, well, if you don't wanna read the book and you wanna have a happier time, I suggest watching Encanto. It is the happy version of 100 <laughs> Years of Solitude. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'd known about this book for a while. I've read short stories by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And for me, uh, I knew it was a very seminal piece of fiction. And when I went to film my movie in Colombia, I wanted to do as much research as possible. So that was part of my reading list beforehand. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's magic realism. I do like magic realism overall. Um, and overall, I think it for me it's fun talking about what this book accomplishes and the thoughts of it but sometimes it can be a chore to actually read the book so i think for me i think that's the best way to summarize the experience now i completely agree i actually first heard of this book by you um and you know uh, i first saw gabriel garcia marquez you know who's also known for writing a lot of short stories but me personally i knew him from love of the time of cholera i read that book in college and i loved it so i was like okay it's got to be good uh it, it is a completely different book <laughs> from that one it is a completely different story and experience like you said it could be a chore i honestly i struggled reading this book it's written in like big block paragraphs and if you have add like i do it's hard to keep your attention for that long for 400 plus pages. So, uh, you know, you, you have to find your ways to, to keep engaged. And it, it can also be difficult because there were so many characters and it spans so many different events over so many years. So when you like keep picking up the book to read it and then start and stop, you're gonna like forget what happened to who, who did what and all that. But overall, you can actually get the sense of like that little town in Macondo and how it's related to Colombian history, Latin American history, and how it's actually relevant, to, to, you know, like, despite whatever country you're in. But like, there's a lot of uh, realistic events that people can learn from. And when it comes to colonization and you know, town po population and just the industrial revolution in and of itself. So uh, I mean, there's a lot of takeaways from this book uh, once it gets you know, th the message taken from it. So uh, let's get into it. You mentioned magic realism, which is a Latin American narrative strategy that, I mean, yeah, some some American film and media, you, you can kind of see that, but uh, it's really told in the literature version for, um, that mixes a lot of supernatural type of elements in a realistic setting. So uh, what, you, but there was a lot, obviously, in this book, but what were your thoughts of how Marquez used it throughout all these events and all the people? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's one of the sort of more non-Latin examples is um, Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, where the opening line is, like, the dude wakes up as a bug, right? And that's a good sort of example of what magic realism is because it's very literal, right? It doesn't try to explain the magic like it would in Harry Potter or something like that. It just very much is the fabric of the world. And, you know, some, uh, so you have to kind of interpret it in that way. And I think, you know, having dived in more into the history of things, of all of this, it really is a way to essentially process pre-colonization as well as colonization because it presents multiple realities at the same time. And so, you know, that's why it makes sense. A lot of it did come out of, you know, Latin America. 
for that reason, because certainly, you know, they were kind of a lot colonized. Yes, colonized. Um, you know, uh, whether by the Spaniards or, you know, whoever else. And so that that tracks in that way. And I think what what makes it universal in this way is obviously it presents a theme. And I think beyond the sort of uh, colonization, pre-colonization aspects, I think really what the core theme of it ends up being is this idea that as humanity, we think we progress yet we don't because we don't learn the deeper lessons from generation to generation, they are inevitably forgotten. And so I think ultimately that's what the book illustrates. Yeah, and I think uh, you, you say these lessons keep repeating yourself and that was definitely, we'll, we'll get into the themes more so uh, later on, but that's definitely one of the big recurring themes that happened in this book is that certain thoughts and certain events kept repeating itself and it definitely, came to the literal explanation of history just repeats itself. Um, slightly different, but the same kind of results or the same kind of messages and lessons are learned from it. And we see it with this Buendia's family that this book is covering seven generations. Uh, there's a lot of people involved, but you see this recurring idea that I, like I, I feel like it was every other and you can correct me if i'm wrong but every other generation like something happened that they learned from a previous generation um slightly different but again history repeating itself and uh that it, it's a very cyclical pattern rather it's a vicious cycle but it you can see how different the world their little town in Macon, macondo um was changing throughout the years and how it goes back to normalcy and solitude and then it goes into chaos and then back to normalcy. You can see these waves, ups and downs, but ultimately coming full circle. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, and part of it, I think it speaks to, you know, now we have a word for it, which I don't think, you know, was, if it was prevalent, it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, wide as it is now like generational trauma. Right. And so I think, until you feel that side of it, you can never really move past it on an individual family level, let alone society, right? And so, you know, I think this, the book itself is very dour in that way. Um, whereas like, I think for me, I'm personally more optimistic and um, whatnot. And I think, I think that's part of the reading is that it's this book just beats you to the ground in that way over and over because a, it doesn't make any progress because you're literally reading the same names with each new generation and they're repeating yeah. the same mistakes over and over again, uh, which becomes the the point of the book. But in that way, it's like nothing's literally moving forward <laughs> except the outside world in some sense, but in a negative way as well. I agreed. And I think that was one of the more difficult things that I had with this book is because of the naming convention now maybe marquez back in the 60s however long it took him to to write this book maybe he thought it was easier that like every other generation is basically the same name and then you know skip another generation it's a different name so it's like uh it, it's it, there are different variations of the same name it gets hard because again in the paragraph block style that is so detailed with the most <laughs> extent uh, it, it, like superfluous details that you're like, is as a reader, you question yourself, is this detail important enough to remember for the next generation that we're eventually gonna read? And I think that's where I got lost with this book because there are so many different people spanning so many different years. You, you have a hard time delineating who's who. And I'm a big fan of like different storylines connecting to each other when there's like nonlinear format and somehow everyone's connected, but I think it was just the structure of this book. It was hard for me to string who was who, especially yeah. when all the names are so similar. And I, I, you know, certainly I think that's a point of it. And I think if anything, in a strange way, it, it does point to the similarities of cultures because we can look at like European, not necessarily medieval times, but like if I said King royalty, Louis, yeah, royalty yeah. for sure. You know, like 
exactly. So if I said King Louis, you'd be like, which one? There's 800 of them. Right. Right. So it's, it, it, I think it, part of it is it, it gets at that sort of notion, um, you know, for lack of a better term of, you know, European versus Latin American sort of roots where, you know, the idea that, yeah, we do want to be essentially remembered throughout history. And in a weird way, um, we've all kind of bastardized it where we just name our kids the same thing. <laughs> and it might be reading too much into it, but yeah, we put all this hope on future generations. Um, you know, essentially like, I mean, there's that selfish notion in our culture, living vicariously through your kid, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a part of that that it's hinting at in that way. Right, and I think there's a lot of personality traits when it comes to naming convention as well. And not everyone, I, I gotta say, it's like that, but usually when you name your kid, it's because you wanna keep on the tradition or the value that people know the importance of a certain name. That's why you get juniors and seconds and all that. And uh, a lot of it comes down to ego. And that's a big running theme in this book is egoism between all of these characters. And they're so lost in their own personal life and what they're going through uh, and, and their individual, you know, self egotism is that, that they're, yes, they're in this world where everything's happening out and like in that small town, but their biggest problems are their, their selves and their personalities and how to keep passing that on to the next generation. So it, it, I think it comes down to a lot of, some characters are very narcissistic <laughs> um, and some have like just an, this inflated ego that, uh, that ends up becoming, it's just really uh, a facade. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I heard a summarization of this. The Aurelianos tend to be withdrawn, but with lucid minds, while Jose Arcadios tend to be impulsive and enterprising. And yeah. <laughs> there's a discussion. there it is. That's literally seven generations summed up. Yeah, exactly. And I think that it says like some are alpha power and you know uh, to, to build that self, and some are just too too worried about themselves that they they don't care about the outside things. So there's a lot of introverted and extroverted problems with these uh, these generations. But again, with all the names that are so similar, it's hard to tell or hard to remember who has the mental issue or like the, the dementia who they, we see this recurring issue that some people remember all the memories and some can't their their the brains and their mental conditions like they they have amnesia and so the, that's a running thing throughout this book it's that memories are so important and they get passed on through generations but then some people are forgetting everything that's happening so that uh, what did you think of that convention? Just um, the the importance of memory, uh, of memorizing and remembering big life events. Yeah, I mean, I I think it speaks to the wider thing we've been sort of talking about. Of you know, we are doomed to repeat things because we just forget, right? And uh, many times we have rose colored glasses of how things were in the past, even if we didn't live those things, right? Um, and I think that, it, you know, it's it, there's also the notion of how history gets formed, right? Um, certainly, you know, in our world, like those who win wars get to write the history of that war, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it speaks a lot about that. And, but sort of going back just a tiny bit, What's also interesting is in, in no novels like this, normally you get some sort of like timeline at the beginning, right? Because um, right. I've, I've read certainly enough historical fiction and it'll have a map of like how, you know, it used to be like, for example, like a novel like Paris by Edward Rufford, it has like what Paris used to be and what Paris is today. So it ha you get the map um, and also you get sort of a timeline of the various family trees for that so you can kind of keep up. This, you don't get any sort of graphic whatsoever. You just have to figure out on your own and you know create one or look one up online. Thankfully, there's so many people that <laughs> made that, you know? I know, and like, if you have this particular copy, there is a family uh, legend, 
family tree. But quite honestly, I don't think it's like as helpful as they try to be. It's really not because this only shows so many people and the books, um, detailed paragraphs over 400 plus pages kind of goes out the window because uh, you just have to remember their personalities more so than their names. And uh, I think that's what I was trying to do to distinguish who's who, um, especially with the book with so many different people. Uh, yes, it's helpful. So it, if you did get lost, <laughs> seemingly like I did, uh, there are, like you said, a lot of graphics out there that, that will help you paint a more visual picture um, and a, a more like the, the heritage line uh, of the Bendias family. Uh, so moving on, uh, we, we talked about a little bit about the the moving in circles and the cyclical pattern and the the, the importance of time. You mentioned that the the actual words many years later used nine times, years later eleven times, so on and so forth. The word actually later is used eighty three times in this book. So it just shows how much this book passes on and expands over the course of 100 years. Well, the irony um, so is that it, it has those words, but like with the first paragraph, many years later, he faced the firing squad. Colonel uh, Aurelia Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice, right? That literally yeah. the first opening sentence and you've jumped in time at least three times right there. So you're going into the future, mm -hmm. then you're in the present, but then now you're going back in time. <laughs> right. right, I mean, it, it just shows just how complicated this book is because it does span so many different times and events with different people and the different memories that everyone goes through. I think the only other book that I can this might be a terrible reference, but I think people would understand. The only other book that I have personally read that has so many different characters that's seemingly connected is the Bible. The freaking Bible. Millions, I don't know if that's an exaggeration, thousands of people are in that book. And you just have to remember who's who, who's the parent of who, who did what, who interfered with whom. There's so many different people. And those are... Okay. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, necessarily supporting this. I'm merely pointing it out. Um, there was a New York, I believe it was the New York Times um, editor, uh, Kevin something, and this is from a while ago, but he said, everyone in the world should be required to read two books, the book of Genesis and 100 Years of Solitude. Now, <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with it, but uh, you know, interpret as you may. I mean, I can see how we made that relation because considering I have not read the whole book, and I actually have read the whole Bible. Yes, I have people. Uh, I definitely understand that that relation because there are just so many people you have to follow and you have to remember who did what and who's connected to who. So I digress a little bit, but yes, I can, I can see that connection. Uh, and uh, so let's move on to the, just the, so this little town of Macondo, it starts off small, and we see throughout the generations, things come into the town, it gets big, it gets more populous, and then, it, you know, not to like jump too far ahead, but a lot of things happen, and then they get back to that small vibe um, that it started with, it. so like the whole cyclical pattern. Um, so what did you think about the, the, uh, the Jiffy, the, sorry, the gypsies that are in this story that leads the small town to the outside world, which basically kind of starts people coming in. I think it's, you know, I mean, this book is almost 80 years old and it's still, you know, now, I guess more prevalent than ever, the idea of tourism, right? Um, <laughs> because like in a weird way, you know, cultures like this, yeah, want to maintain their sovereignty, let's say. And, you know, they find this remote location where they think they can thrive. And then the outside world just continues around them. And then not only that, but just kind of forces their way of life onto you, right? I mean, I, I can kind of look at how the islands of Hawaii are like, please, we 
we can't have more tourists at the moment. Like, please don't come to Hawaii, essentially. And yet, mm-hmm. all I ever see is like people in Hawaii being like, I'm here in Hawaii and this and that. And it's, and listen, I want to visit, I've never visited Hawaii. I would love to and, and things like that. But I think the idea of commercialized tourism, which this isn't exactly a one to one analogy, but I think it's similar enough. I think that's what it's hinting at is we just, you know, for progress sake, without the say so and consent of, you know, certain peoples, we just like, no, this is better for you. And certainly that seems a very historical aspect. I mean, that's literally colonization, right? Yeah, I was just gonna say, but just basic colonization of this town, of countries in general, like how do you think America started? <laughs> or yeah. North America, United States started is because we came in, or the, you know, the English came in. Uh, and then we just spread out and expanded from there. It was like, that's just colonization in general. And like with this small town, we see that this, and seemingly slow, but very fast progress of going from a small town to building this railway that leads this train into, which brings in outside people and expands that town and builds to, like with the industrialization and the advancement of their technology as well. It's just, it opens the door to a lot more people coming in and bigger problems being created in this seemingly small town. Yeah, and that's why, you know, I wanted to kind of, I tied in the first part about tourism because I think that, you know, we yes, of course we can look at colonization as, as a thing, but it's, you know, that's the past one can argue um, and yet it's not right. And so the modern day thing that we're facing is that, and I, I look at it, it's very strange when, you know, California, for example, faces fires all the time. And yet yeah. now we're seeking the wisdom of native Americans who knew how to handle this. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And all we, and it's, and it's that sort of thing of all we had to do was listen. And yet it was just this blind optimism towards progress, progress, progress. And this is the way, as opposed to, yeah, just kind of realizing that there's multiple paths and that, uh, you know, the way of life that we're trying to essentially diminish is valuable. Right. And we see not just in the country of Colombia that the story takes place, but just in the world. And even look at America. Uh, America itself had a civil war and lots of lots of all Americans died during that. And uh, you can see throughout all these generations who's actually in for power and who's actually in for what they believe is actually right and true and just. And uh, I think that's uh, a a message that you can definitely take away from all the tragic massacres and and events that happened in this book, that those are still lessons that people have learned just because it happened in this little town that those happen in real life is based on real life events and that and you know it's important to to remember yeah and i'm curious like from your perspective right the the book basically ends with aureliano learning to read and interpret these scrolls which essentially predicts you know what will happen (laughs) and you know that a he even skips over some pages because he's just too impatient. He needs to find out like what, what is going to happen. Right. And basically calamity happens. Right. Um, and I'm curious because at least for me, um, there's so many people that always worry about the future, want to know the future, um, not knocking psychics, but like we'll go see psychics or whatever and try to just get at, you know, what's going to happen. And it's like, you know what? The irony is if you just kind of studied the history of humanity, you might actually be able to predict some stuff. Right, exactly. If you pay attention and actually remember everything, yeah, you can definitely learn from from past generations. But that was also the problem with this particular family is that some people remembered and some didn't. And it was getting lost in translation throughout the years. And had they not written it down and actually documented it. I think it that little town of Macondo and th- all those generations would have been lost had someone not taken the actual time and effort to document it all. And especially at that moment when uh, 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 
he was trying to go through these documents and translate it, um, he, he was realizing that, yeah, he is a part of this generation where the, this book is um, focused on the importance of their name. And here at the end, they're trying to even remember it, remembering that this whole family was important to begin with. And, and it's so, it really does show that, is it important about the naming conventions and what they did? It really doesn't matter because at the end, if it's not documented and told, you know, genuinely through the mouths of people, did it, did it, did it ever really happen? Yeah. And that's the sad truth. I mean, again, like we can just sort of rewrite it. Um, you know, that notion that Christopher Columbus discovered America, it's like, did America need discovering <laughs> or did he just hap did he happen to, you know, I mean, there's multiple meanings of discover, like, uh, you know, you can discover the taste of apples if you've never tasted them and seen them in your life. Right. Like it's mm -hmm. a, it's a self discovery, but it doesn't mean like you discovered what apples were because they always existed. Um, and I think that's what this sort of ultimately kind of, speaks to that idea of of you know we just have to kind of keep discovering for ourselves even though these things always existed um and if we just learn to listen we'd be all right but things just get so lost in time i mean yeah i mean okay. you know the, the more the more time goes on it's even less about like a translation error and more just like we want the bullet point version you know right and and like and that was the irony of it all is that they're explaining the importance of the memories and all these events and here at the end of the book they're even trying to remembering <laughs> they're just trying to remember if it even happened in the first place um so it it kind of hurts a little bit especially when you go through all these events and you're like oh okay maybe it did happen maybe it didn't and uh, and I think that's what's sad because this this family left such an imprint on this town. Where at the end they're like, "Oh, you you guys are part of all of this. Who knew?" You know. And again, the importance of documenting everything. So journal jur journal everything, everyone. If you want to remember it. Uh, all right, moving on to so we mentioned a lot of these events. There was civil war that happened in with one of the generations there was a banana plantation rebellion and both of these were based on real life events that happened in colombia uh the the civil war was based on the, the thousand day war um that happened from 1899 to 1902 and then the banana plantation rebellion was based on the united fruit company the american fruit company back in Oh, I forget what year that was. I have it in my notes somewhere, but the banana plantation rebellion. So uh, another historical event in Colombian history. So Gabriel, Gabriel Garcia, because he used real life events to tie in and it, it was like the inspiration for this little town and uh, reflected, you know, the, uh, the importance of something small to something becoming so big and actually just massacring a lot of people, which was pretty hard to to read. But again, it goes it goes so fast. And then the again with the importance of memory and magical realization, uh, realism strung in. Unfortunately, the only lone survivor because he was, he was the only person. Now he's confused if it actually really happened because there are no other witnesses because they all died. Yeah, and you know certainly memory messes with us. You know we we can kind of construct it however we want um based on our own perceptions of things um but i think also too i, I think it speaks to that idea of i mean you know even even now we're not in, certainly in a civil war but the fact that there's talk of like america re-entering civil war and you know tensions being so high between like you know two sides or whatever um and even just like kind of like the union labor strikes and so forth. Um, there are many parallels um, and not just to us. I know universally, you know, there's a lot of tension in the world in general about those yeah. two things, right? So all, and all for the sake of like 
progress and, and whatnot, right? Right, and you definitely see history repeating itself, even to today's standards, that the it's seemingly country is divided based on different opinions. And that's how the Civil War happened in this book, is there was a rigged election and there was conservatives against liberals. <laughs> And that that created a whole problem. We have that problem now, even even today. And uh, to to go back a little bit, the banana the banana massacre was nineteen twenty eight. Sorry, I had to throw that in. Um, but yeah, and again, with civil war and union strikes are still happening to today, despite um, you know food plantations. It, it, it could be like any difference. Just the importance of you know safety regulations and not being in safe environments will cause anyone to strike, no matter what company you're at. Uh, so yeah, it's just, again, with the history repeating itself, we see it in different ways and it is still relevant. And this book was written how many years ago and we're still seeing all these problems. And so people learn from it <laughs> or like just try to learn from it or try to remember what happened back then that you can apply to today that might make things better. Uh, all right, so yes, very important, <laughs> important stuff. A little bit about, uh, um, so the different characters. Uh, was there any particular, because there were so many, was there any particular characters that personally stood out to you? Um, I never, I mean, for me, sort of knowing what the book was about, I never really took it. You know how there, there's essentially ways you can sort of, see a movie or, or or read a book and you know sometimes you can get really into the personal and track the person for me right. always just kind of mentally maintained a bird's eye view of everything right mm -hmm. and i think that's what makes it difficult to read sometimes is because like you're doing this mental exercise of okay i know like whatever i'm tracking it's less important about this specific moment it's more important what it means in the greater whole and so where am I in this sort of tapestry of, you know, this town and these families? And so in that way, yeah, that's why, like, for me, I've been sticking to more about talking about the themes rather than like, hey, uh, Jose Arcadia Buendia, he's my favorite character. You know, I love that when he did this, <laughs> you know, like, no. Right. I think, um, yeah, I, I agree with that because, you know, each of them serve their different purposes per generation, you know, and some of them left footprints and marks for the next generation. And some just literally just vanished <laughs> and was like, had no sign of ever reappearing again. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess they were there. Had it not been documented, I would not have believed they ever existed. So. There, there was a weird balance between those who were important and those who just were seemingly a blip on the radar. Radar, like there's and, no in that sense. I mean, there's literally no protagonist, right? In the traditional sense, like that goes out the window. And even, even in like stories that span multiple generations, and so forth. Like you, you sort of start to get a sense of who you're tracking. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I just sort of look at more traditional writing if you will and you start to get invested in those characters lives like you haven't not that you don't have an insight into their wants and their needs but you just kind of, they're secondary really right um and sometimes tertiary yeah like it's 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 weird in that sense and um i, I guess i don't know how to articulate be, beyond that but but yeah, I guess it's just an experience because I've, I've read enough of these where, you know, you get invested, even if there's multiple protagonists that you're tracking across time. And you're like, oh, I'm invested. Whereas this, I'm, I'm not really invested in any of them. Right. And like, and that was what I was, you know, struggling with while reading these books and so many different characters and just you and I being in the television film space. I was just thinking myself creatively, how would they ever put this into media form other than, you know, written. And if they made it into a film, which I don't think they, it would be successful as a film because there's so many characters and that'd be hard to condense that into a two, three hour movie. But if they made it into a TV show, maybe it could be like a generation per episode 
for, for one or two episodes. Season. I know. The, like, and that is the problem because there's there's just so many people and so many events, it's overwhelming. And you'd have to break it up individually for us to even understand what happened and, and the importance of who uh, of like who did what. And if if that was ever to be this is my just creative way of like if it was ever to be creative uh adapted creatively that would be the best i personally think that would be the best way to um make us comprehend everything that happened in this book uh yeah. i mean again so for me like and kanto is sort of i don't know the the best version that i think is possible for a film of this you know that it's this town that uh that is created because a woman and man they essentially escape but the man dies um and he bestows the gift onto the woman uh they have children you know this town flourishes but it's not really about them it's really about the granddaughter um and how like her life has been affected by this right so it chooses to focus on a singular person mm -hmm. after the multiple generations um and i think yeah, I think film-wise, that might be the best you're going to get in terms of this adaptation. Unless it's like a weird storytelling device that, you know, is a very more European abstract type of cinema versus mainstream. Uh, I don't know, but it, it would be interesting to see if anyone actually, you know, takes on because not to jump too far ahead in our conversation, but there, there was a talk with I believe Netflix was trying to develop um, this into uh, a series or um, um, it was, yeah, developing a series based upon the book. It was supposed to be released in 2020, but we all know what happened in 2020. COVID happened and shut down everything. So it, it's been delayed and there hasn't really been any updates on it since. So we don't know if it actually is coming out or if it's even continuing. Um, so if it does, I'd, I'd actually be curious and I would watch it just to maybe get a better understanding of this book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it can be done right. Um, and if they did, I would look forward to that. Like, uh, you know, I, the equivalent for me is HBO did, um, his dark materials, which is Philip Pullman's trilogy, the yes. golden compass, Amber Spyglass. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, whereas the movie failed, they did a Golden Compass movie, um, not them directly, but like Once Upon a Time. And it was just terrible because it was a movie. And, you know, when they did each book as a season of a TV show, it really thrived. Right. And not to get too far into that, um, into that series, which is also good because I did read the book um, and I have watched the series, is that like there was also that movie came out at a different time where and there was also issues with the term God. So th there was a lot of religious problems that came with the film that people were against. So there were many reasons why the film ultimately wasn't successful. Because if you watch the TV show, they don't mention the term God like at all. So they, they avoided the original problem that <laughs> didn't work for the film. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's, it's very tough. And that's why like, you know, in this sense, like for it to be successful, I think you have to be head on with what this book is right and what it's mm -hmm. and, and at times the a very somber nature of it uh if you try to like gut that then no I, I, you're just scratching at the surface and you know taking the intent of uh gabriel garcia in a in a negative way and you know unfortunately he's no longer here to uh kind of <laughs> guide us whether or not he'd actually like it or not but uh you know hopefully they if they do make it i think it can be successful they just have to keep to his spirit and unlike with his dark materials not stray away from you know the taboo that is written into this right exactly and i think the way that they could make this a success is that if they actually give them proper time for us to breathe with these characters and go through these events because while reading it it just felt like yeah there was a flow and we went from one one event, years pass, next event, years pass, people come in, people come out. It, it felt like it went so fast that I didn't get a specific amount of time from like, where, where did we cross to the next generation? 
you know, the, so it, I, I think to understand it maybe better is that we actually have to like sit with certain characters for a while and understand what happened. Yeah, I mean, certainly like, again, I, I look to other books, right? And it will give you maybe at the start of a chapter where you're at, right? You know, let's say 1973, boom. Now you're like, okay, cool, I'm in 1973. This, it just kind of verbally said, like, you know, hours later, many years later, like, it doesn't even yeah. give you an uh, indication of, okay, five years later or 10 years later. You kind of have to interpret based on the context that you're given and guess that, okay, cool. Okay, so this is, all right, so this is his son. Got it. Okay, cool. Right. There's no proper delineation in breaking the separation between one to the next. And... It, everything bleeds together there and lies it gets it gets kind of polluted not gonna lie it really does and i i think it would help if again they they separated things more in that sense uh i was gonna say something but totally forgot um so this book did actually get a lot of critical acclaim uh back when it was released it i mean it won a lot of different awards and uh, Marquez won a Nobel Prize for this. Er, and it, I mean, and it's also on Oprah's book club. So I was like, okay, she knows what she's talking about. So <laughs> I'll follow her lead. If she likes the book, I mean, it's gotta be good. And it's on uh, the list of like 100 best books of all time to read. So th there is a lot of critical acclaim with this book. Yeah, I mean, it, uh... In that sense, it's definitely sort of stood the test of time. Like I said, almost, you know, we're approaching 80 years, um, minus a few years, but close enough uh, in the grand scheme of things. And um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, in spite of its problems, uh, I think even just on this show itself, we, we've certainly read worse. <laughs> right. So. I'm, I think the... I don't want to say even a problem because maybe some other people read it and completely understood who was who and what was what. But I just found it very convoluted where things bleed so much into each other that you're having a hard time deciphering what even happened at the end of the day. And because you and I were, we are very American, we are raised with American history. Um, I personally am not, in, well informed on Colombian history or just Latin American history in and of itself. I am woefully ignorant. I am, <laughs> I'm going to admit that. So maybe just being personally not well informed with historical events that, you know, happened that are related to this book. Maybe that's another reason why I wasn't understanding it because I've never heard of these events. I've never lived or know anyone related to these events. Yeah. Compared to maybe someone back when this book was released, it was so relevant at that time that people were like, oh yeah, I understand. Perhaps. I mean, you know, I, I think it's interesting how even just within our own country, we don't remember certain events. Again, we just kind of have these surface level bullet points. Um, I mean, take Martin Luther King, for example. You know, I have a dream. And I, that's probably where most people's, you know, understanding of Martin Luther King sort of ends. Like, yes, he was a, you know, civil rights activist. He made a, I have a dream speech, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, but do you even know, like, the crux of his teachings? So, and that's what, that's what I do love about, you know, and I think one of the missions underlying of why we started this was to read more books um, that perhaps we might not otherwise, and just to, you know, to get into those parts of cultures that, you know, we're not understanding of. I mean, I, you know, the, not to get too far ahead, but the next one's going to be Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, which talk about weird timing. We had chosen it before uh, this, before his attack. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, we'll definitely get into it next month. But, um, right. you know, that is about essentially the history of India, right? And its independence. And so, yeah, you know, that'll be an interesting. So in that way, I think while it is work, I do appreciate sort of having to learn it. And I think, um, yeah, I, th I think that's what makes reading fun in general. 
Right. And exactly to your point, I think that's the reason why you and I do it because we are both scholarly in that way that we like to be open to other otherworldly things. And we like to learn about new things that we don't know about. And we're, we're open to reading books like this. I mean, had you not mentioned it, I probably, it probably would never cross my radar. Um, and, but reading it after the fact and knowing like what an impact it actually did make in the literary, literal space, um, you know, it, it is important for people of our generation, for the next generation, whoever to, to read this because they're, they're not, they're definitely not teaching this in American schools. You know, and I, I think it's it's stuff like this where you have to not to say force yourself, but you have to be open to learning about other cultures and other events to paint a bigger picture of the world. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, um, this might be a little bit too far down the rabbit hole of stuff, but um, you know, just the kind of a decay of meaning. Like I, you know, and I think that's what this book sort of speaks to is that again, we just don't go beyond the surface level. So with all due respect to someone like J.J. Abrams, you know, his idol is Steven Spielberg, right? And so he tries to mimic Steven Spielberg, but who did Steven Spielberg learn from? Kurosawa and so forth, right? And so right. eventually we just kind of like, you know, take from this, take from this and and, and don't really uh, unearth the richness of the original work itself, right? Um, and so I think that's also part of all of this, um, you know, that, that this book is sort of speaking to is just know the history. Yeah. And and if you don't know the history, you know, educate yourself. And and that's what I'm definitely doing with this book. I'm learning about big cultural events that happen in Colombia. And I've personally never been to Colombia. You have. But, but that doesn't mean I can't be informed of its past and important events that shaped the country and what it's like today and how it's relevant for future generations. Yeah, and it's a it's a very beautiful country, you know? Yeah. And respect it, you know? I think for me, if there's any sort of delineation, it's uh, appreciation versus appropriation is what appreciation is when you, you know, support the people um, themselves, right? Like you buy from them, um, and so forth, right? Like just even that sort of simple thing, like literally, you know, buy local instead of like, ooh, I like this Colombian t-shirt, let me buy it from Amazon. Right, you know? support small businesses. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think the main takeaway, me personally from this book is, um, remember your roots, basically. Remember where you come from and why it's important and why it shapes who you are today and why you do the things that you do today. Absolutely. So any any last final thoughts of you of this book? I, listen, I, you know, I'll, I'll just speak to you personally. I, I appreciate you going on this journey. I know it wasn't the easiest book. I know you didn't enjoy it all the way through, but um, but I'm glad that you did um, go on through this journey. And uh, to everyone else, I think we're going to figure out some sort of system where, because uh, as we dive into it, you know, Obviously, we're going to be like, this is a book that I've read before, but, um, you know, we try to always pick books that neither of us has read. And so that can be a catch 22, right? <laughs> we right. might pick a book and be like, ooh, this is uh, this is not good. So we'll, we'll create some sort of system where, um, you know, we'll hit the fail safe button of like, all right, you know, we'll switch it up to a new book. Um, and so we'll kind of keep you guys updated. Because I think, I think it's also part of reading in general in life is, you know, don't waste your time on, I'm, I'm trying to become better at myself. Like don't waste your time watching a movie, reading a book, you know, watching a TV show. Like if, if it's not for you, it's not for you, you know? And right, exactly. And there are millions of other books out there that can easily, you know, fill the, fill the void as well. But I mean, yes, admittedly, I did have a difficult time reading this book, but that doesn't mean I don't understand the importance of it. And I think that's what I can appreciate the most about this particular experience. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, for us, I think we, uh, you know, I think it was a great discussion. Unlike, um, you know, we did all tomorrow's parties, and oh boy, that was a slog for both of us. And that, that was, was like rough. Pages. that was rough. 
Um, so we'll but have speaking a scenario of, like that moving yeah. forward. So speaking of books that we've read in the past, we we do we are slowly building our library of discussions, and so our next month we are reading Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. I believe you've read it so far. I have not yet, but it is down the line and it's going to be coming up next and then the the month after that is the remains of the day by one of my favorite authors as well so we we do have a slew of books coming up go check them out phil where can everyone follow you i'm at phil svitek and uh, i'll just give the rest of the list then so uh, the, yeah, the day is in october saturday by ian McEwen is november and then I don't have it in front of me, but Hercule Perot's Christmas by Agatha Christie, very apropos for December. For so December. That comes out this year in terms of what's down the pipeline. Absolutely, and I'm I'm excited for all of them. They are all seemingly different from each other, diff completely different authors and different styles. So we're we're definitely expanding our 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 library in our sense and uh just understanding different writing methods and stories that, that are out there so and everyone can follow me at sarah Queenie tv keep reading thanks everybody mm -hmm.